Okay, got PowerPoint open to record, not as a crutch. Let's... Okay, so <clears throat> today we're going to talk about the central dogma. And in the context of central dogma, we'll talk about the key enzymes you need to know about if you're going to do molecular biology and you're going to build stuff. So start. Yesterday we said all life, all cares about replication, right? And I'll talk just again a little bit about the selfish gene theory because I want to elaborate more on that. So um, there was a controversy, sort, well, not, I don't know about a controversy, but a different way of thinking of things uh, about evolution. So some people view um, evolution in terms of the selective forces selective forces uh, happen on the organism, okay? And some people think that selective forces happen on populations. So it's populations evolve, organisms evolve, and the selfish gene theory was the first theory to kind of say, no, maybe these aren't really even right. Um, really what's happening is there's a more primal level where selection is actually just happening on individual genes individual genes. And anything that you see evolving in the organism or the population is really just a mask hiding selective forces changing individual genes, okay? So that's the selfish gene theory. And again, all genes, their primal focus is to replicate. Okay, so we're gonna talk about how biology does that. And that is the central dogma. Okay. So again, more just definitions, enzymes, enzymes. We're going to talk about the enzymes that are essential for that replication. And enzymes are, again, the verbs of the cell. They are proteins that do stuff. Proteins that do stuff. Okay. And yesterday we talked about DNA. Okay, so let's draw that out more. So yesterday we talked about the phosphate backbone. So this would be the phosphate backbone. And DNA has direction, okay? So you need to know this. I know you've heard about it, but I remember how hard it was for me to memorize and like understand the meaning of the direction. So let's talk about that. Um, in the DNA, these two strands, strand one and two, are two completely different molecules. They're completely different. Okay. If this one has a T, this one has an A. If this one has a G, this one has a C. If this one has a C, this one has a G, right? These are different molecules. Okay. And they're actually oriented differently. So if we put three prime here, five prime here, five prime here, three prime here, right? They're anti-parallel. So they're going in opposite directions. It's like a left hand and a right hand. They're different chemical structures, different molecules, okay? So let's look at, in our handout, um, I wanna explain where this comes from. So we talked yesterday about the sugar carbon backbone of the D, oh, I should be able to draw, yep, of the DNTPs. Right, so if this is like a DNTP, well, it's not a TP anymore, but this is a base um, that would be, this is the phosphate backbone, it would be in DNA. And if you look at those carbons, I remember telling you there was carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five. And if this is the phosphate backbone, when you see five prime to three prime, what that means is that the linkage of the phosphate backbone is going from the fifth carbon five to the third carbon. So the five to three, the meaning of that is it's telling you the direction from the orientation of the carbons on the phosphate backbone. Okay. So the directionality is important. Okay. So let's just talk a little bit more about directionality. Um, when you think of DNA, when I think of DNA, whenever you look at DNA, you're usually going to see it written in 
five to three prime direction. Now we can write it in different directions because on a computer we can take this sequence, if this was A, T, G, C, we could run it through a computer program and we could flip it, which would be telling us, uh, I, I should say we could take the complement, there's two different functions, function one, function two, we could take the complement, which would, a computer program would give us the T, the A, the C, the G, so it would take the complement, right? We could also do a second function, which would be to reverse, we could reverse the orientation. So we could take this molecule and we could look at it in a different way from three to five if we just rearrange the base pairs in a computer, okay? Or we could take a third function, which does both, called the reverse complement, which is gonna give us the opposite strand in the opposite direction, okay? So you need to know these because we're gonna use these in computer programs quite a bit. So when you order your primers, you have to put everything in the orientation of five prime to three prime. If you pick out a gene and you wanna flip the orientation and look at something, you might wanna take the reverse. So you might wanna take the complement. Or if you're designing primers to do a mutagenesis reaction, you might wanna take the complement to kind of make things neat in a computer file that you're looking at. So you just gotta kind of be aware of these things, but also be aware that when you do these things with the computer, the biology in the cell can't do that. The biology in the cell sees a molecule, five prime to three, or the other way, and enzymes that read that can only read and, and write in a certain direction. So the direction is not so important when you're mentally thinking, because you can flip things around, but in the cell, the enzymes, it's extremely important, okay? So five prime to three prime is what's called sense. It makes sense, right? And the reason it makes sense is because if you look at messenger RNA, messenger RNA is always five to three, and messenger RNA can be translated, translated, read by the ribosome, and translated into protein. So that's why it's called sense, because it makes sense to the ribosome, okay? So by definition, messenger RNA is five to three prime. Memorize that. Um, antisense, 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 then is the opposite, three to five. Okay, so that's what sense, antisense means. Antisense, an antisense, if you in theory had an antisense messenger RNA, it, ribosome would not be able to translate that. And you might find that in viruses or something like that. But if that's the case, if the virus genome is in the wrong direction, it cannot be translated by the ribosome right away. Okay, so direction is important. So, talked about that. Okay, so my visual trick, because this was hard for me to remember. And, I, and one of the reasons it was hard for me to remember because I never thought it was that important, but it is, it's super important, especially when you start like looking at molecules on the computer, okay? So here's a visual trick that I remember it. Five is greater than three, so I write it like this, and I think of it as like a hill or like a triangle, okay? And my trick is that a polymerase, a polymerase will read uphill, okay? So polymerase reads uphill, but it writes downhill, okay? So all polymerases are gonna write, they're gonna assemble five prime to three prime. That's the, that's the, the new strand of DNA. It's gonna get assembled in this direction, but they might read the construct the other way. A ribosome, ribosome is gonna read downhill, ribosome. So a ribosome is going to take this transcript, it's going to get fed through five prime to three prime, and it's going to assemble the protein. Okay? So you want to know that. You want to know the directionality. Because when you start to do PCR, and you have five, three, three, five, and you want to design a PCR primer, you got to design a primer here like this, and here like this. And you gotta know how to write the sequence, how to type it out, A, T, G, C, or is, do you write it C, G, T, A? How do you know? You gotta put that into a computer when you buy oligos or what we would call primers, okay? So we're gonna talk about that more in lab, but that's why this is important. 
you got to know because you got to know the right direction when you buy stuff. And if every time you need to buy something, you go to your advisor and you say, I don't know how to do this. Will you buy this for me? <clears throat> it's a bad, it's a bad scenario. So you want to know how to do that yourself. Okay. Um, so let's talk about replication of DNA. Because the way that biology does it is the way that biotechnology, biotech mimics. So we just look at how biology does it and we just kind of mimic it. Okay, so there's the same steps in replication of DNA that there are in PCR. So the first step is denature. Okay, so if you have a strand of DNA and in the cell, it would be wrapped in the double helix, bad double helix, but it would be wrapped like that. Okay, the first thing that has to happen is the enzymes that read this. This is five, three, three, five. The enzymes that read this don't read double stranded DNA. They don't read DSDNA. No, they don't read that. It has to be split apart, right? So it has to be denatured. So there is an enzyme called helicase, okay? And helicase is a protein that will grab the DNA and it will unwind it, okay? So instead of double-stranded DNA, you now have a point where helicase grabs it, unwinds it, right? We know that, we've seen that in basic biology, right? Yes. So this is not unfamiliar to us. What you want to start, what you want to start paying attention to now is you've learned all these processes before, but now you really want to start paying attention to the enzymes that do this, the name of the enzymes. Because what you'll notice is that when you start doing your own biotechnology reactions in molecular biology in the lab, you're going to start to see that you're actually using these types of enzymes in chemical reactions, right? Because we want to sometimes mimic what's happening in the cell, in the test tube. So you want to start to pay attention to the names, okay? So helicase is your denaturing function in the cell, okay? And in PCR, we'll talk about how PCR mimics this, but PCR is going to be a different functional means of denaturing the DNA. Okay, so to denature the DNA means to unwind and basically break apart the double strand in DNA. That's what to denature DNA means. Um, if there's ever a bold word that I don't define, then just let me know. Okay, the next step, step two of replicating DNA is annealing. Okay, an uh, annealing. Okay, so we got our split apart DNA. So what has to happen is the polymerase we're not there yet, but the step three enzyme is the polymerase, okay? The polymerase is a protein, an enzyme that writes the DNA, right? It reads uphill, writes downhill, and the polymerase can't just grab DNA and start writing, okay? It needs a primer, it needs a primer. So there is a enzyme in the cell, a protein called primase, primase, which is gonna put a little primer of matching base pairs to match that DNA. And then now the polymerase can grab that and it can start writing DNA, okay? So there is a priming step in the cell, just like PCR, to replicate DNA, which, and the enzyme that does that called primase, okay? And if I say oligo, oligo is a small sequence of, um, the nucleotides, so like A, T, G, C. That's what an oligo would be. We buy oligos, or if I say it acts as a primer, a little oligo, that's what that means. So the oligo was added by the primase? Yes, the primase creates the oligo and it adds, it, it makes a little molecule uh, and sticks it right there. Does that make sense? Good question. I appreciate the questions. Uh, okay, so, Final step, step three of PCR and or replicating DNA is extension, okay? And I know this is review for you guys, but we're gonna focus a little bit more in detail in a little bit. Um, okay, so the first thing you need to know is that the polymerase, polymerase is the enzyme for step three, okay? And this is the enzyme you're gonna put in your PCR reactions. And in most cells, the polymerase is a big complex, okay? So a complex is a machine of different subunits of proteins, 
Okay, and if you do the reading, it'll tell you all about all different subunits that have different functions. You don't necessarily need to memorize those, but you definitely want to know that a polymerase is the enzyme that writes DNA. And you want to know that in most cases, the polymerase is a complex. But when we do it with biotechnology, it's usually not a complex. We're just using the enzyme that writes the DNA. Okay. So... The thing you want to note, so now since we're talking about enzymes, polymerase, if in biotechnology we use enzymes, we need to start understanding the variables of these enzymes. So enzymes are like cars or like they're things that they're like things that do stuff, right? If you are in the kitchen and you have a toaster or if you have 10 different toasters, there's different things about those toasters that make those things different, right? There's different variables. Um, and there's some things, there's some toasters that are better, there's some toasters that are worse. Okay, polymerase or enzymes, all enzymes are the same thing. There's many different polymerases from many different organisms, and they all have variables, and some are better, and some are worse. And in some cases, you might want to use a worse one, and in some cases, you might want to use a better one. What would be the scenario? Well, for instance, I'm just wondering if we get into this yet. What you want to know now is that there are high fidelity polymerases and low fidelity polymerases. There are ones that make errors pretty often, and there are ones that correct their errors, and so they make errors very low, low error rate. Okay, and this is very important if you are using these enzymes to write your own DNA. So you wanna know that. Origin of replication. Okay, so we're eventually going to have a whole lecture on plasmids. Plasmids are small sequences of DNA. And an origin of replication, origin of replication, you will find this on chromosomes, you will find this on plasmids, you will find this as a unit on things that need to be replicated. Okay, and the origin is a sequence of DNA, sequence of DNA or base pairs, that's so going to be A, T, G, whatever random variable that attracts the polymerase. Now I'm, I'm simplifying that. Okay. There's much more complexity here. Like the, the, it recruits this protein, this protein recruits that protein, but eventually it attracts the polymerase. Okay. So the origin is basically a flag that tells the polymerase start replicating here. Okay. Cause here's why. It's a problem if in the cell you're constantly replicating DNA, right? You, that process needs to be controlled. And one of the ways that it's controlled is at the, at the origin of replication. So you want to know what that is. Okay, another enzyme that we care about, ligase, which is involved in replication. So as the DNA replicates, there's one strand called the leading strand, leading strand. And in this case, the polymerase, in both cases, the polymerase are writing in five to three. But in this case, the polymerase can just run and run and run and run and run and run and go, okay? On the bottom strand, it's opposite. It needs to synthesize this, and then it needs to hop off, and then it needs to synthesize this. You guys know this. This is the, called the lagging strand, right? And these are called Okazaki fragments. Okay, and these are written by the polymerase, and there's a little primase here, right here, but here's a problem. This spot right here doesn't get sealed. And when I say sealed, it means the phosphate backbone at this point is not linked, okay? So there's an enzyme called ligase, which comes in and links the phosphate backbone. So it seals, quote unquote, seals the DNA. Okay, and we use this in biotechnology. If you do a cloning reaction and you have a plasmid and you wanna insert, ooh, rainbow gene X right there. I'm starting to get good at this, this is fun. Uh, okay, if you wanna insert random gene X um, and you put it in there and let's say you got some overhangs so it binds and matches, it anneals, it's still not sealed. If we were to heat the reaction, it would just jump out. It would fall out. So it only gets sealed if, the, if you add ligase. 
and ligase will come in and seal that phosphate backbone. Is that clear? So that's one case of where the cell is using ligase and where we would use ligase. Okay. The other thing you want to know, I'm just looking at my time, is if we're talking about bacteria, so we'll have a whole lecture on prokaryotes versus eukaryotes, but bacteria have systems called um, restriction modification, modification, whatever you guys know, system. Okay. And what happens is bacteria are always at risk from attack by viruses. And viruses work by basically injecting their DNA. And the virus wants its DNA to be replicated, right? Selfish gene, de, excuse me, selfish gene theory. The virus wants its genes to be replicated, but the bacteria wants its genes to be replicated. So there's a battle here, right? And the way that the bacteria can protect itself from a virus injecting its DNA is through restriction modification systems. So what the bacteria does is, if let's say this is a bacterial chromosome, let's make an example. There are two enzymes, one, two. One is gonna be a methylase, and another is gonna be a restriction enzyme, okay? And the function of the methylase is it's gonna run around the DNA, and if it sees a sequence that it likes, let's call it GATC, it's gonna put a methyl group there. And wherever it finds that sequence, it's gonna put a methyl group, okay? And the function of that methyl group is to protect because the restriction enzyme is an enzyme that is a nuclease. What do nucleases do? Okay. What do a nuclease think? What think of Close, very good. So they they will cut DNA. So the function of a nuclease, if you ever see nuclease, it cuts DNA. Okay. And if you get your DNA cut, that's bad, that's a bad thing. So what happens is these nucleases, oftentimes they recognize a specific sequence. So we're using GATC. So let's say it recognizes GATC. Okay. So the bacteria makes this nuclease. I'll make it rainbow nuclease. Okay in the cell, this whole thing is a cell, okay? So there's these nucleases floating around and the nuclease, the restriction enzyme nuclease wants to cut the DNA at GATC, okay? But if there's a methyl group there, it can't cut, okay? So what you're seeing here is a case where the bacterial cell has methylated its own DNA to protect itself from its own restriction enzyme. So it has a, basically an antidote or a blocking system that causes its own restriction enzyme to not cut its own DNA. But then now imagine a virus attacks the cell and it injects its blue chromosome. And on that chromosome is a sequence GATC. And there is no methyl group on GATC. Now the restriction enzymes will find that genome and they will cut it at the GATC and that will destroy the virus genome, okay? So do you understand how the restriction modification system is essentially a way for the bacteria to kill invading virus genomes, but also protect itself? Does that make sense? Okay, and the reason that this is important, oh my gosh, there we go. Like, does it ever methylate the virus? No, because the methylase is only going to be methylating DNA when it's replicating. Okay. So the one out. Yes. Very good. Very good questions. Um, now, why is this important? Because in biotechnology, we use restriction enzymes. Some common themes of restriction enzymes. So oftentimes... In molecular biology, we are cutting and pasting DNA. 
and you cut with the restriction enzyme and you paste with sort of, um, you could say ligase paste. Okay. So we use these and there's a whole bunch of them. And we use these to cut DNA for our own purposes. And some common themes are restriction enzymes recognize what are called palindromic sequences. And what those are, are like G, G, A, T, C, C. They're sequences that read the same forward as they do backwards. So if you look at the five prime to three prime and you take the reverse complement, it's the exact same sequence because what binds here is. Does that make sense? So a restriction enzyme will see this and cut that DNA. So that's what restriction enzymes are. And we use those every day in molecular biology. So you want to know where they come from. They come from bacteria. They're bacterial immunity systems. Okay. There's a final enzyme I need you to know about called DPN1. DPN1 is a very special restriction enzyme that recognizes specifically methylated DNA. And the reason this is important is because there are many cases where we want to make a mutation, say, and we'll do this eventually in the lab. We want to make a mutation in a plasmid. Um, there are cases where we want to destroy the DNA or the nucleic acids that came from the bacteria. And we want to select for, select for DNA that we amplified by PCR. And if we use DPN1, it will destroy the bacterial DNA because if it was replicated in a bacteria, it got methylated. But it will not destroy DNA that you replicated by PCR because you never added a methylase to your reaction. Does that make sense? So there are cases where we want to select for DNA that we amplified by PCR. So that's why DPN1 is important, and DPN is a restriction enzyme that recognizes methylated DNA. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about PCR. PCR is a mimic in the tube of how microbes, or all life in general, replicate their own DNA. So it follows the same basic pathways. And I'll say a couple things about PCR. Um, so Kerry Mollis is a guy who invented PCR and he thought of it when he he's from California. He thought of it when he was surfing and he was on drugs on LSD. That's how he thought of it. And he won the Nobel Prize in 1993 and PCR changed our world. So what does that tell you about biology, especially biotechnology? It tells you like following the rules is not always the best way to go, right? Sometimes the most creative insights, and I'm not saying anything, I'm not, I'm not telling you guys to take drugs or anything like that. Uh, I'm just saying um, people who think differently and I think creatively, uh, don't be afraid to be creative. That's what I'm saying. Just don't be afraid to be creative. Don't be afraid to break the rules a real, little bit because those are the ways that you have big breakthroughs in biology. Um, so that's what I wanted to say about that little bit, because it's funny that PCR is so important and it was thought of by sort of this social deviant. guy. <laughs> um, OK, so the first step PCR is denature. Um, OK, and we do not use helicase. No, we don't use helicase. What we use is heat, right? Because we went and we got a special polymerase. Polymerase, you've heard this story before from the hot vents from the hot vent bacteria, and it's a polymerase that works at high temperatures, and it's called TAC polymerase. Have you guys heard that story? Okay, so you know about that. So we can heat the DNA to denature it. So here's where some variables start to come in, okay? The, you guys will be determining the temp of your denature, okay? And the temp of your denature is regulated by which polymerase? you use. If you're using TAC, TAC likes some temperature X. If you use Fusion, that likes 98. If you use Q5, I think that uses 98. So this is the one I use. So if you, depending on what enzyme you use in your reactions, you need to adjust the denaturing temperature. Okay. Just make sure I don't miss anything. 
Next step, step two, annealing. Okay, we mimic annealing, but we don't use a primase. We make our own primers. And the reason we make our own primers is because we want to control exactly what's being replicated. So we build primers on, if this is gene X, and we want to amplify gene X, we can make a forward primer and a reverse primer that will amplify gene X. So we make our own primers, and the primers are oligos, and we just order these from a company. Usually they charge you, what's the rate? I think it's 17 cents per base pair. So we buy those. We make our own primers. And you'll learn how to make your own primers. Um, extension. Step three. Extension. Oh, wait. I missed a variable. The variable of annealing. The variable of annealing is, again, the temperature. So what you're doing is you're using temperature. You split apart the DNA with a hot temperature, then you lower the temperature at the annealing. So if, if denature is at 98, usually annealing temperature gets reduced to around 55 to 65 degrees Celsius. When you design your primers, you get to pick this. You get to choose what your annealing temperature is. And the higher the annealing temperature you choose, the more specific, specific your amplification of gene X will be. So when we do these in the test tube, we have to worry about amplifying incorrect products, things that we don't want. So when you design your primers, my I, I design them 56 to 65, okay? And the more, the higher you go, the more specific you go. And if your primers don't work, you can design new primers and redesign your annealing temperature to see if that fixes the problem. Okay, so that's the variable that you control in step two is the annealing temperature of your oligos. And the reason you control that is because you designed them. Okay. And what is the actual physical property that controls the temperature of the annealing in the oligos? Yes, the hydrogen bond. So if you have a oligo that is a thousand G's, each of those G's is going to have three hydrogen bonds and it's going to have a super high uh, annealing temperature. And that's where the GC clamp comes in is when you design your primer, if there's a bunch of A's and T's and G, whatever, you want to pick primers. You have a whole sequence to pick primers from. You've got a whole long thing from here to here. You can pick primers anywhere. Okay. But you want to pick something that starts and ends with a G or a C. That's the GC clamp. Because these are going to hold tighter so that end won't be floppy. You want this tight. Okay. Now back to three extension. So extension is when the polymerase is writing your DNA, okay? And when you set your program, there's more variables here. Variables. Here, there's two variables, one and two. First variable is temperature, and that's going to be regulated by what your polymerase enzyme likes. So we're going to use fusion, which is 98, okay? The second variable is time. And time is regulated, again, by the polymerase. These polymerases can only go so fast. That means they can only write a certain amount of base pairs per second. Okay? So fusion is very, very fast. And it writes 1,000 base pairs every 15 seconds. Okay? You want to know this. So that means if you want to amplify something that's 5,000, base pairs, you better make that extension step, step at least five times 15, which is going to be one minute, 15 seconds. Does that make sense? If you make it any less than that, there's no way your PCR will work because you physically have not given your polymerase enough time to write that DNA. So you need to know these. You need to know, I mean, not like for the test, but like if you like do an experiment, you need to know the properties of your polymerase. You need to know the the properties of your toolkit, okay? Let's see, is there anything I missed? So with respect to the low fidelity, high fidelity, TAC is terrible. TAC is low fidelity. Don't ever use TAC in a lab anymore. There's no reason for us to use that. Use high fidelity. 
Fusion, or Q5 are the names of typical high fidelity, fast proofreading polymerases that we use. And the error rate is one in every 10,000 base pairs. So if you amplify something that's 10,000 base pairs with one of these polymerases, you're gonna have one error. TAC is one every thousand. So TAC would give you 10 errors in your PCR product if you amplified a product that was 10,000 base pairs. Okay, so you need to know that. The only reason you wanna use TAC is if you want to potentially randomly mutate. Or the other solution is sometimes there are cases where TAC is cheaper. So sometimes there are cases where you don't care about the sequence fidelity. So you just use TAC. That's the other cases, expensiveness. Most of the time we use Fusion or Q5, high fidelity ones. Let's see. Oh, and then just another common thing that you'll see is loops, right? So we have steps one, two, three, denature, anneal, extend, okay? And when you tell the computer program to loop, 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 35 times is usual for standard PCR. And this amplifies, if this is y-axis is concentration of product, this causes your product to go into an infinite, well, not infinite, until you run out of reagents exponential curve of concentration. Okay. Um, how much time do we have? Plenty of time. Okay. You guys all good with that? Questions? That too simple? Yes. Is there any way to go back and fix the errors after it's Uh yes, but it's a huge pain in the ass. So like yes, we can we can we can and I'll teach you guys, we can change the base pairs to anything we want in molecular biology. But if you want to get it perfect, you want to get it perfect the first time. Because then to go back and make correct the error is an extra like sometimes two weeks, sometimes a month of work. Okay. So like if, yeah, you, you, usually, you usually don't want to make errors. So like there's, again, there's no reason to use TAC if you're cloning stuff because Unless you want the errors, which you usually don't want. But there are cases where you would want to induce random errors. Um, but yes, you can fix it. The other way to do it is to just do it over again. If you got an error, um, you can just do it over. That's usually what happens. It's usually faster to just repeat the experiment and try it again than it is to try to go back and fix the error that you produced. Okay. So that was step one of the central dogma of biology which is that DNA, well, DNA gets replicated. I guess that's not actually part of the central dogma. Central dogma is DNA goes to RNA, goes to protein, okay? And you also want to know which processes and which enzymes control these steps of the central dogma, okay? So DNA, if it gets replicated to DNA, that's going to be controlled by a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, okay? That means it reads DNA and it writes DNA, but not all polymerases are that. There are DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Ooh, nice, and that means they read DNA and they write RNA, and those are the ones, RNA pol polymerase, that control the first step of the central dogma. Those are the ones that make messenger RNA. Okay. So how does this process is called transcription? You want to know these words like the back of your heart. You want to know replication, transcription, translation, and you want to not get transcription confused with translation. You got to just be able to rattle that off. Okay. So how is transcription controlled? Let's look at our handout. So here's the figure on central dogma. You guys have all seen that before. You may not have gone into as much detail in the structure of genes, okay? So if you look at a gene, this is a eukaryotic gene. There's introns and exons. Exons exit the nucleus. They are the ones that code the messenger RNA. 
So they'll get spliced into, I'm writing here with red, but I'm talking about this sequence, this sequence, this sequence. They'll get spliced into a messenger RNA, five prime to three prime. It will exit the nucleus, okay? But this has to get produced. This transcript has to get made, okay? And these sequences are important for controlling that transcription of that gene, okay? So the first thing you need to know is that all genes, okay, have like a light switch, which can make it on or off. Some of these light switches are leaky, means they're kind of off, but they sometimes allow things to get through. Um, and there's all kinds of complex regulation that happens that regulates genetic transcription of a gene, okay? And some of that information is encoded in these different things, okay? So a promoter, promoter, is a sequence that the either transcription factor, TF, if, I, if you ever see TF, that means transcription factor, that's a protein that can bind to a promoter or an enhancer. So it's a DNA binding protein, it's gonna have lysines and arginines, it's gonna grab onto the DNA, and it's often gonna recruit an RNA polymerase, okay? And then that RNA polymerase is gonna pop on I don't have different colors here. It's gonna pop on to that promoter and it's gonna start scanning and it's gonna start reading and writing the transcript, okay? Um, what else do you need to know about? How does the, back to my notes. So the RNA, Paul, it's gonna pop on the gene start writing, it would have been recruited at the, at the promoter, okay? And it starts writing the gene. How does it know when to stop? When to stop writing transcript. In theory, it could just keep going along the whole chromosome, but that's a huge waste of energy, right? Because every time you add a base pair, that takes energy, okay? So it needs to know when to stop writing. So this is called termination. And there are terminator sequences that can tell the RNA polymerase to fall off. So let's look at those. These are bacterial methods. So if you're in molecular biology and biotechnology, you need to know bacteria, you need to know eukaryotes, you need to know everything, okay? So this is bacterial termination. And there's two ways, very simple concepts. One is there's a sequence, okay, that recruits. So this is a sequence of messenger RNA. And if this is the RNA polymerase, this orange thing, it's reading the DNA, it's reading the DNA and it's writing transcript messenger RNA. As it reads, the transcript comes off and there's a sequence in that messenger RNA that will recruit recruit a protein called Rho right here. And Rho will scan that transcript and it's faster than the RNA polymerase can write. So basically, if this is the transcript, if this is the RNA polymerase, if this is Rho, it basically catches up and then it hits the RNA polymerase and pops it off, okay? So that's called Rho-dependent termination, okay? Then there's also hairpins, okay? So with a hairpin, RNA is single-stranded or double-stranded? Single-stranded single RNA. Can be double-stranded if you make a virus. But in transcript, it's single-stranded. And that means that you can get a scenario where if this is a transcript, there's base pairs. If these base pairs here match these base pairs here, you will get a situation where they bind and they form a hairpin, which is this hairpin. Hairpin, okay, and hairpins can attract proteins which will knock off the polymerase. So these are two methods, polymerase, these are two methods of termination for transcription, okay? So this is how the polymerase knows when to stop, okay? So if you're ever writing a gene or cloning a gene, you wanna produce a protein, you clone a gene, you wanna make sure on the three prime end of that gene, 
there's a terminator. Okay. So the other thing is you want to make sure that there is a promoter. If you just clone a gene, gene X, into a plasmid, and there's no promoter and there's no terminator, will it be on or off? Off. And a lot of times we want to have control of when it's on or off. So we can pick from different promoters and we can pick from different terminators. So you want to know these. You want to know, ah, no, that's not what I want. Getting confused and pressing everything. <laughs> you want to know the structural organ. Oh my God. You want to know the structural organizations of genes. Okay, back to my notes. Okay, what else is there to talk about? How much time do we have? Oh, we're getting close. Okay. So there's one other very, very, two other very important enzymes you want to know about, and they come from viruses. <gasps> and viruses break the central dogma. They break dogma. <laughs> so everything in biology is not black and white. Okay. So we have central dogma, which is DNA to RNA to protein. Okay, but there's an enzyme that goes backwards. It goes from RNA to DNA. This is called an RNA dependent DNA polymerase or called a reverse transcriptase. Okay, so if you ever study messenger RNA, if you ever want to study transcript in molecular biology, you will use a reverse transcriptase to write what's called cDNA. So if here's your transcript, five prime, three prime, messenger RNA, if you want to study this transcript, RNA is very unstable. You don't ever really want to work with RNA. So what you do is you do a trick, you do a hack where you mix it with the reverse transcriptase and reverse transcriptase can read this and it writes it with a matching DNA molecule now it's double stranded. One strand is messenger RNA and the other strand is DNA. Now it's more stable. Then you can actually use this as a PCR product. So the way that you make this cDNA, which is called complementary DNA, it's complementary because it complements the messenger RNA. The way that you make that is through RT, reverse transcriptase. So if you ever see RT, PCR, that's reverse transcriptase, PCR. That comes from a virus. The reason it comes from the virus is because virus genomes are often messenger RNA. And if the virus wants to replicate its genome, it encodes a reverse transcriptase that can make it into cDNA. And then once it's cDNA, that genome can integrate, integrate into the genome. So if you're a virus, one of their tricks is they like to integrate their DNA molecules into the genome. But you can't integrate messenger RNA into the genome. You can only integrate DNA into the genome. So you got to make DNA. So they use reverse transcriptase to make cDNA. And then they use an enzyme called integrase, which grabs their cDNA and integrates it into the genome. Okay. Now that's important because sometimes, sometimes we want to insert a gene into the genome. And the way that we do that is often with an integrase enzyme, okay? So you wanna know these names for the rest of your life. If you ever see an enzyme, you wanna remember that name and you wanna know what it does. How much time? Okay, three minutes, good. Last step of the central dogma, translation. Okay, so this is where RNA gets made into protein. What do you need to know about this step for biotechnology, okay? Um, you already know the basic steps. You know what the ribosome is. Here's one thing you might not know is that, let's look, let's look at this. Each of these three base pairs in a messenger RNA construct is going to code for a codon. I know you know that, but I know that you might not know that certain organisms prefer certain codons. So for instance, glycine, the amino acid glycine, which you should now know how to draw, glycine has four codons. Might actually have more, I'm not sure, I think it's four. 
And some organisms encode in their DNA a preference. It means every time you find a codon for glycine, it's usually, say, number three out of the four. OK, so this, they prefer certain codons. And this is important because each of those codons needs to have a corresponding tRNA molecule. And if you don't make the tRNA molecules, you can't assemble the protein. So some organisms make more tRNA for certain codons that they prefer. OK, so now let's put this into a scenario where you care about it. Imagine you want to make a transgenic insect and you want that insect to express gene X, but gene X is from bacteria. So you put gene X into the insect chromosome right there, and you want it to translate, express and translate your protein, which would be protein X corresponding to gene X. But you only get a tiny chunk of it. Ah, and then you see what was the problem? Why isn't it making the whole one? Well, you look at that sequence and there's a string of rare codons that the bacteria prefers, but your insect hates. So the insect literally does not have enough of the tRNA molecules to string together that full protein. OK, so there's codon preference. And oftentimes to fix this problem, you will do codon optimization. So if you want to express a bacterial protein in a plant like Bt, you might change the DNA sequence to the preferred codon usage of the plant. And that way you're going to get maximum expression of that trans gene. OK, so that's codon preference. I will quickly finish. You want to know that start codon is ATG. That means in the messenger RNA transcript, the first codon for every protein is going to code for a methionine. So all proteins will start with methionine. Sometimes that methionine gets cleaved off, but all proteins start with methionine. Unless the caveat is sometimes in bacteria, they can start genes with a valine, which is GTG. That's the one caveat, but all proteins start with methionine. Um, that's why methionine is important. You want to know your stop codons? TAA, TAG, TGA. Just memorize these. If you ever see a star, when your protein, if you're writing out a sequence of a protein, so you have alanine, lysine, methionine, star, star means stop codon. So you designate your stop codon in the writing system with a star. Um, We'll talk about the eukaryotic stuff later. We'll end it there. Good? Very good.